All right, just getting this everything set up. Sorry that I'm a little bit late. Doesn't look like anybody's here, so no harm done. Uh, so today I just want to go over the three waves of modernity um, by Leo Strauss. Uh, it's, it's actually quite short, so what we can do is read it through together and uh, kind of discuss it paragraph by paragraph. I've also written some notes um, so I can understand, uh, explain some of the paragraphs a little bit better. And uh, yeah, I have the music playing in the background if it's too distracting at any point. Again, no one's here, so I don't think that will be a problem. All right, so let's get started. Uh, so just to give some background, I guess, um, Three Waves of Modernity was written in 1975. Uh, Leo Strauss is a, uh, a political philosopher. He uh, was born in Germany in 1899. Uh, he's, he's no longer alive. He, he passed away, in, I think, in 1975? No, 19, not 1970. That's, that's when he... <laughs> this is when this was published. Uh, he, he's not alive anymore. Um, or else he'd be 120 years old. Uh, but just to kind of give like a brief history, um, at age 22, in 1921, he received his doctorate from the University of Hamburg in Germany. Um, and he was influenced by Heidegger and Husserl from phenom the ph phenomenology movement that was going on. Um, he actually attended lectures. Uh, he was part of the German Zionist movement where he met uh, Anna Arendt and Walter Benjamin. So. If you, uh, I, I think Walter Benjamin actually knew him quite well, so uh, you'd be able to cross compare some ideas between him and Walter Benjamin. Uh, also, probably someone that I would want to eventually get to covering on this channel, Walter Benjamin. You don't really see a lot of uh, material on him, but he has some really interesting ideas. Uh, at age 33, in 1932, he moved to Paris, um, and, and then a few year, years later, he moved to England, fleeing the, the Nazi invasion. Uh, he was, again, Jewish, so it's just kind of a, a mandatory thing he had to do. And uh, a couple of years later after that, he moved to the United States, uh, became a citizen. He spent all most of his time in the United States at the University of Chicago, where he was professor and gave classes and uh, published his books. Uh, and so I guess, uh, yeah, so, and he, he achieved professor about 10 years after moving to the US. So when he was 50, he got professorship. That was in 1949, so uh, after the war. And uh, a couple of years later, he started publishing um, some books that he's well known for, one being uh, called The Persecution and the Art of Writing. That one goes over I haven't read it myself, but based off of the synopsis of the book, it, it goes over how the texts that we've read in the past, um, like Plato and Aristotle, um, that those writers put hidden meanings into um, their texts because uh, they wouldn't, uh, they, they would be, uh, what's the word, reprimanded, or they would, they, if they said what they actually wanted to say, then the ruling government at that time would um, basically uh, exile them or or worse uh, you can look back uh, at Socrates you know Socrates didn't write anything down but uh, he spoke his mind and he was eventually uh, convicted for corrupting the youth and was uh, was killed but we could also say that he committed suicide too I think that's another that's for another time uh, but anyway um so persecution of art and writing and then he published another book that he's well known for about five years after called thoughts of machiavelli um, and we'll see some machiavelli in uh the three ways of modernity um, so those two publications uh i'm going to turn off the music because i was hoping the music wouldn't have voices but it does it's one of the things about twitch music streaming that 
it's probably a good problem to solve. Uh, so I can stream this music because I purchased a license for Monster Cat, and Monster Cat basically allows you to play their music online and basically use it in the videos afterwards. You just pay them a small fee. But if the music has has voices, I, I I can't talk and also listen to voices, so I'm gonna turn it off for now. Maybe I'll turn it back on later, depending on who comes and who doesn't come. Okay. Okay, so we published Thoughts on Machiavelli. That was in 1958, and then uh, Three Waves of Modernity. This is in 1975, so this is more than 10 years after that publication. So this is one of his older writings. Again, it's pretty short, um, so we're going to go through it together. And uh, if uh, I'll have it up on my screen so that we can read it together. I also have a copy here in my notes. Just kind of give a brief context to this. Um, uh, I guess maybe one one brief context is uh, there's lots of kind of philosophers in the 20th century that are considered uh, like anti uh, anti enlightenment enlightenment um, where uh, they believe that. The Enlightenment had such a large effect on how we perceive ourselves as kind of rational beings, beings with reason, and to use that reason as something that makes us human. You know, animals don't have the capacity to reason like we do, so it's in our uh, power to to use that to its fullest uh, capabilities. But uh, the anti-Enlightenment is about how that kind of use of reason has kind of uh it's, it's created a void in the in the spiritual realm where we, we know how to do things but we don't know exactly why we do those things and if we don't know why we're doing them then uh that can lead to existentialism which we're not going to go over today Okay, so let's just start. Three Waves of Modernity by Leo Strauss. Toward the end of World War I, there appeared a book with the ominous title, The Decline or Setting of the West. Spengler understood by the West not what we are in a habit of calling Western civilization, the civilization that originated in Greece, but a culture that emerged around the year 1000 in Northern Europe. It includes above all modern Western culture. He predicted that the decline or setting of modernity. His book was a powerful document to the crisis of modernity. That such a crisis exists is now obvious to the meanest capacities. To understand this crisis of modernity, we must first understand the character of modernity. Okay, so the first paragraph, um, what uh, Strauss is kind of telling us is that there's, there's this crisis at hand. Um, he hasn't exactly told us what the crisis is yet, uh, but it has to do with Western civilization. So that's not any Eastern culture. That's Europe. That's America. It's a kind of the Western uh, philosophical tradition, starting with Plato, Aristotle, Socrates, and kind of has grown its roots from there. And... Uh, so it exists. He he says it's it's obvious that it exists. So that's maybe one assumption that we could question, because uh, he's not really saying why it's obvious. To understand the crisis of modernity, we must understand the character of modernity. So we, we, the the word modernity he's saying here is is it's pretty, it com, it's it come it's loaded. It's, there's lots of baggage that comes with modernity. So we don't even know what modernity is, and he's going to go over this. All right, let's go to the next paragraph. And if you have any questions at any time, feel free to just send something in the chat and I'll stop and we can go over it. All right. So the crisis of modernity reveals itself in the fact or consists in the fact that modern Western man no longer knows what he wants. 
that he no longer believes that he can know what is good or bad, what is right or wrong. Okay, I'm just going to stop there for a second. So again, this kind of value distinction versus knowing how versus knowing why. Uh, that's kind of what Strauss is saying here. Monitoring reveals the fact that modern Western man no longer knows what he wants. Uh, what's good or bad? You know, when you want something, you desire something, you see it as something that's inherently good or bad, what is right or wrong. Until a few generations ago, it was generally taken for granted that man can know what is right and wrong, what is just or the good or the best order of society. In a word, that political philosophy is possible and necessary. So that we're kind of at a standpoint where we didn't really feel like we had the need to ask why. It, we, we kind of assumed that it was good. We had some kind of foundation from society that certain things are good and we should strive for those things. Okay, so in other words, political philosophy is possible and necessary. So political philosophy is possible because since we know what good, good is, political philosophy is, is a means to achieve that good. Um, okay, so in our time, this faith has lost its power. According to the predominant view, political philosophy is impossible. It was a dream, perhaps a noble dream, but at any rate, a dream. Okay, so kind of our, our belief in uh, this political philosophy as uh, being something that will help us achieve good, we've lost faith in that power. We no longer think political philosophy is, is possible to get us that it's impossible and it's a dream. While there's a broad agreement on this point, opinions differ as to why political philosophy was based on a fundamental error. According to a very widespread view, all knowledge, which deserves the name scientific knowledge, but scientific knowledge cannot validate value judgments. It is limited to factual judgments. Yet political philosophy presupposes that value judgments can be rationally validated. According to a less widespread but more sophisticated view, the predominant separation of facts from values is not tenable. The categories of theoretical understanding apply somehow the principles of evaluation. But those principles of evaluation together with the categories of understanding are historically variable. They change from epoch to epoch. Hence, it is impossible to answer the question of right and wrong, or the best social order in a universally valid manner, in a manner valid for all historical epochs, as political philosophy requires. Okay, so there's a lot there. So there's um, the first thing that he cites here is that partly why this is an issue is that there's a fact value distinction. Scientific knowledge is very good at facts, but it's not um, good at validating beliefs. Um, for some reason, we believe that our kind of capacity to reason um, would in, uh, would implicitly give us value. And then there's a, a slightly more sophisticated view that denies that where um, that reason can give us values, but it's dependent on the, the current historical period that we're in. Different historical periods value different things, but that still doesn't really get us to what we want from political philosophy, which is this kind of objective universal set of, of values that we can achieve. If it's just dependent on the time period, then um, it's not universal. <clears throat> the crisis of modernity is then primarily the crisis of modern political philosophy. This may be strange. Why should the crisis of a culture primarily be the crisis of one academic pursuit among many? But a political philosophy is not necessarily an academic pursuit. The majority of the great political philosophers were not university professors. Above all, as is generally admitted, modern culture is emphatically rationalistic, believing in the power of reason. Surely, if such a culture loses its faith in reason's ability to validate its highest claims, it is in a crisis. Okay. So... You might ask why why is this only affecting political philosophy why why is in other uh, scientific pursuits or eh, not scientific but uh academic pursuits um 
why why is it not affect them? And I guess what Stress is doing is that he's kind of assigning a special property of political philosophy that it's actually not a lot of political philosophers were university professors. They come from lots of different areas. Political philosophy just happens to be where they all converge. Okay. And again, kind of he's restating that uh, if a culture loses its faith in reason's ability to validate its highest claims, then it's a crisis. We can we no longer feel like we have the means to uh, achieve the value uh, or achieve values. We have good abilities to get facts, but not values. And the more facts we get, it's not going to help us get values. There's two distinct kind of processes. <clears throat> What then is the peculiarity of modernity? According to a very common notion, modernity is secularized biblical faith. The otherworldly biblical faith has become radically thisworldly. Most simply, not to hope for life in heaven, but to establish heaven on earth by purely human means. But this is exactly what Plato claims to do in his Republic to bring about the cessation of all evil on earth by purely human means. And surely Plato cannot be said to have secularized biblical faith. If one wishes to speak of the secularization of biblical faith, one must then be somewhat specific. It is asserted that the spirit of modern capitalism is of pur Puritan origin. Or to give another example, Hobbes conceives of man in terms of a fundamental polarity of evil pride and salutary fear of violent death. Everyone can see that this is a secularized version of a biblical polarity of sinful pride and salutary, salutary fear of the Lord. Secularization means, then, that the preservation of thoughts, feelings, or habits of biblical origin after the loss of atrophy of biblical faith. But this definition does not tell us anything as to what kind of ingredients are preserved in secularizations. Above all, it does not tell us what secularization is except negatively, loss of loss or atrophy of biblical faith. Yet, modern man was originally guided by positive project. Perhaps that positive project could not have been conceived without the help or surviving ingredients of biblical faith. But whether this is in fact the case cannot be decided before one has understood that project itself. So there's just a, a lot of skepticism here by Strauss. Um, he's, he's trying to understand what modernity means. And his first reaction is to go to secularization, where he defines secularization as um, something that has a biblical or religious origin, but then the faith, kind of the content of the biblical tradition goes away, but the habits and the behaviors that were developed in that tradition stay and he kind of says that capitalism is of puritan origin there's nothing religious about capitalism but we kind of interact with it or it it, it kind of has the similar characteristics of um, duty towards one's uh yeah duty i guess so <clears throat> um but again he, he's kind of skeptical because if if this concept of secularization is purely negative, then it doesn't kind of fit our idea of modernity as being a positive project. And so in this next paragraph, he uh, tries to basically state the positive aspect of what modernity could be. Can one speak of a single project? Nothing is more characteristic of modernity than the immense variety and the frequency of radical change within it. The variety is so great that one may doubt whether one can speak of modernity as something which is one. Okay, so modernity is not like a single thing. It's, it's much more complex than that. So it's not just one positive project. Mere chronology does not establish meaningful unity. There may be thinkers in modern times who do not think in a modern manner. How then can one escape from arbitrariness or subjectivism? By modernity, we understand a radical modification of pre-modern political philosophy, 
a modification which comes to sight first as a rejection of pre-modern political philosophy. If pre-modern political philosophy possesses a fundamental unity, the physiognomy, I can't say that word, of its own, modern political philosophy, its opponent, will have the same distinction, at least by reflection. We are led to see that this is in fact the case after having fixed the beginning of modernity by means of a non-arbitrary criterion. If modernity emerged through a break with pre-modern thought, the great minds who achieved that break must have been aware of what they were doing. Who then is the first political philosopher who explicitly rejected all earlier political philosophy as a fundamental insufficient and even unsound? Okay, I'm just going to stop there for a second. So he's trying to, again, pin down what modernity is. It's not a single project, but it's not just a mere chronology of historical events. Um, the way that he kind of goes about this is that if modernity was a kind of a reaction to pre-modernity, and if pre-modernity had a unifying base, then modernity must be kind of the opposite of that unifying base because there's a reaction of it, or there, there must be some linkage between the two. And so instead of basically looking at uh, chronology, um, he wants to actually find specific ideas or of certain time periods and link that to what modernity could be. Okay. So there's no difficulty regarding this answer. So this is where he thinks modernity starts. And it says, the man in question was Hobbes. Yet closer study shows that Hobbes' radical break with the tradition of political philosophy only continues if in a very original manner. What had been done in the first place by Machiavelli? Machiavelli questioned, in fact, no less radically than Hobbes the value of traditional political philosophy. He claimed, in fact, no less clearly than Hobbes that the true political philosophy begins with him, although he stated this claim in a somewhat more subdued language than Hobbes was going to do. Okay, so political modern philosophy starts with Hobbes. Uh, he also references Machiavelli here, where uh, he says that Hobbes kind of took some ideas of Machiavelli, where Machiavelli first was the one to criticize traditional political philosophy. And we'll go into what traditional political philosophy was and what Machiavelli did um, to basically react and create the, at least the first uh, the first version of uh, political modern philosophy. Okay, there are two utterances of Machiavelli which indicate his broad intention with the greatest clarity. The first is to this effect. Machiavelli is in profound disagreement with the view of others regarding how a prince should conduct himself toward his subjects or friends. The reason for this disagreement is that he is concerned with a factual and practical truth, and not with fancies. Many have imagined commonwealths and principalities which never were because they looked at how men ought to live instead of how men do in fact live. So this is the big thing with Machiavelli. So if you look back, uh, the traditional philosophy, which, which started with Aristotle, it, what, it, what it was all about was trying to be in tune with nature, that kind of, we are humans, we don't have control of nature. Our way of kind of interacting with the world is being, our, how, our, how we ought to live is kind of being towards this ideal idea of what nature is. And Machiavelli is the first one to turn this on its head. And I'm going to just repeat that sentence. Because they looked at how men ought to live, which is, again, Aristotle, living towards nature, instead of how men do, in fact, live. So how we actually live. You know, Sometimes we have beliefs on how we think we are, and then we look at ourselves and what we're doing, and it's there's a there's a discrepancy there and people in political traditional kind of government or sovereigns were basically making policies based off of the ideal state instead of actually kind of looking getting d dirty with what was actually happening around them and and kind of using that to govern okay so machiavelli opposes 
to the idealism of traditional political philosophy, a realistic approach to political things. Again, against idealism for kind of real, realistic, pragmatic activity. But this is only half of the truth. Or in other words, his realism is of a peculiar kind. The other half is started by Machiavelli in these terms. Fortuna is a woman who can be controlled by the use of force. To understand the bearing of these two utterances, one must remind oneself of the fact that classical political philosophy was a quest for the best political order, or the best regime as a regime most, most conducive to the practice of virtue, or of how men should live, and that according to classical political philosophy, the establishment of the best regime depends necessarily on uncontrollable, elusive fortuna or chance. Okay, let's just kind of break that apart. So when we're kind of living towards nature, where we think of nature as this kind of uncontrollable thing that we need to kind of cope with, uh, whether we get the best govern government is a matter of chance. Uh, we can't, if we tried as hard as we could, we still wouldn't be able to do it. That's kind of the idea um, of kind of a traditional political. Um, and then that's because uh, actually, I'm not exactly sure. Best political. Now, according to the classical political philosophy, the establishment of the best regime depends necessarily on uncontrollable. So there's just the idea that if something bad happened with the government, you could always make the excuse that oh, it's just it was just chance. It's just luck. It's bad luck. You know, we shouldn't change anything because you know. It was nature, like you can't can't change nature. This is what again Machiavelli is, is against. This is the traditional notion of political philosophy. According to Plato's Republic, the coming into being of the best regime depends on a coincidence, the unlikely coming together of philosophy and political power. Um, so Plato uh, wrote a book called the Republic, which he kind of designs what he believes to be the best government. And he does say in the book that it, it comes down to chance. If you have a philosopher king, which he says, um, that governs, um, but you can't really, you, you can't design it. It, it kind of, again, depends on this aspect of nature giving you kind of the right, being the right place in the right time. The so-called realist, Aristotle agrees with Plato. Aristotle was uh, Plato's uh, pupil or pupil, student. In these two most important respects, the best regime is the order most conducive to the practice of virtue, and the actualization of the best regime depends on chance. So what should a regime go towards? What is the ideal that it wants to achieve? Well, it wants to be towards nature. Again, this kind of un un uncontrollable thing, um, but it's also about virtue. And this is a very kind of Aristotle idea. Um, we, as humans, this kind of belief is that we should um, pursue virtue. Kind of, that's, that's kind of inherently good. Um, that's kind of the idealism that we've been talking about. Okay. For according to Aristotle, the best regime cannot be established if the proper matter is not available. If the nature of the available territory and of the available people is not fit for the best regime, whether or not that matter is available depends in no way on the art of the founder, but on chance. Again, just reiterating that it's dependent on chance. It that doesn't have to do with the execution of the government. Machiavelli seems to agree with Aristotle by saying that one cannot establish the desirable political order if the matter is corrupt, if the people are as corrupt. But what for Aristotle is an impossibility, this is a, this also this is a good sentence, but what for Aristotle is an impossibility is for Machiavelli only a very great difficulty. Okay. So Aristotle, again, says to get a good government, it you just need luck. You can't can't design it. It's, a, it's an impossibility to design it. But for Machiavelli, 
it's it only requires a lot of effort you can you can get there and nature chance this that whole thing is out the window the difficulty can be overcome by an outstanding man who uses extraordinary means in order to transform a corrupt matter into a good matter so if you have a corrupt government all you need to do is have someone who has a voice who has the right virtue to basically use that in order to create the government and notice how this is kind of the opposite of what aristotle was talking about where the government should act in according to virtue what machiavelli is doing here is he's turning the tables he's saying you should use your virtue to create the government um, we, we're not we're not grasping for virtue we, we got to use and cultivate our virtue to create a uh, government so virtue is a means to government instead of government as a means to virtue the difficulty can be overcome by an outstanding man okay that obstacle to the establishment of the best regime which is man as matter the human material can be overcome because that matter can be transformed okay <clears throat> what Machiavelli calls the imagined commonwealths of the earlier writers is based on a specific understanding of nature which he rejects, at least implicitly. According to that understanding, all natural beings, at least all living beings, are directed towards an end, a perfection for which they long. There is a specific perfection which belongs to each specific nature. There is especially perfection of man, which is determined by the nature of man as the rational and social animal. Okay, again, Aristotle, kind of traditional philosophy, says that man should be a certain way. Man ought to be a way, and we should strive for that. That's, that's kind of what uh, he's saying right here. Nature supplies the standard, a standard wholly dependent on man's will. This implies that nature is good. So we should strive for the good. Again, very kind of idealistic. Man has a, in, has a definite place within the whole, a very exalted place. One can say that man is the measure of all things or that man is a microcosm, but he occupies that place by nature. Man has his place in an order which he did not originate. Man is the measure of all things is the very opposite of man is the master of all things. Okay. So, man is the measure of all things. It's the very opposite of man is the master of all things. So man is the master of all things is what Machiavelli is proposing um, versus the idea of man is the measure of all things. Um, so man, of the, man, is, sorry, man is the measure of all things kind of presupposes that there is some essence of what makes a man and that is kind of what determines what man should strive for. Man is the master of all things, kind of presupposes that mastering things, doing things, controlling things is the essence of man. That it's not that there's this kind of preselected thing that we should call virtue, that we should strive for. It's that it's man is kind of essentially someone that masters things. And that's the Machiavellian attitude. Man has a place within the whole. Man's power is limited. Man cannot overcome the limitations of his nature. Our nature is enslaved in many ways, or we are the playthings of gods. So I'm, I'm not sure if you've read uh, uh, Plato, not Plato, uh, Homer, um, like the, the Odyssey, or what is it? The Iliad. But there's this constant conception that um, men are kind of subordinate to the gods, and it's if the, if men can get the gods on their side, then they're better off. They're they're gonna win their wars and their battles, and they're again what uh, Strauss says here: the playthings of the gods. Okay, so this limitation shows itself in a particular in the inelucidable power of chance 
The good life is the life according to nature, which means to say within certain limits, virtue is essentially moderation. Okay, so again, nature is kind of a limiting thing for man. Um, and virtue is therefore kind of a moderation that we need to work within. There's no difference in this respect between classical political philosophy and the classic hedonism, which is unpolitical, not the maximum of pleasures, but the purest pleasures are desirable. Happiness depends decisively on the limitation of our desires. Okay. This is still kind of stating uh, the idea that was traditional. And this is what Machiavelli is, is against, this kind of idea that virtue is something that is a moderating force, that it's something that is given to us via nature and something that we have to act within. Um, Machiavelli is, is the other way around. And I think in this next paragraph, he kind of goes over this. <clears throat> In order to judge properly of Machiavelli's doctrine, we must consider that in the crucial respect, there is agreement between classical philosophy and the Bible, between Athens and Jerusalem, despite the profound difference and even antagonism between Athens and Jerusalem. According to, Bible, according to the Bible, man is created in the image of God. He is given the rule over all terrestrial creatures. He's not given rule over the world. He has been put into a garden to work it and guard it. He has been assigned a place. Righteousness is obedience to the divinely established order, just as in classical thought, justice is compliance with the natural order. To the recognition of elusive chance corresponds the recognition of inscrutable providence. Okay. Now, this is not what I thought he was going to say, but... Um, in order to judge Machiavelli's doctrine, we must consider that crucial respect agreement between classical philosophy so again classical philosophy is not machiavelli's doctrine classical philosophy is the kind of the traditional philosophy and he's still basically making the claim that um in classical philosophy it wasn't about man being in control of the world it was about man being kind of subordinate in the world having his place and working within those limits Machiavelli rejects the whole philosophic and theological tradition. Okay, this is where he starts. We can state his reasoning as follows. Here we go. Right, one more drink before I start. Okay. Might also take a quick break after this page just to give my voice this quick rest. Machiavelli rejects the whole philosophic and theological tradition. Okay, we can state his reasoning as follows The traditional views either lead to the consequence that political things are not taken seriously, which is Epicureanism, or else that they are understood in the light of an imaginary perfection of an imagined commonwealth and principality, and most famous of them being the kingdom of God. It's a typo. Okay, so he thinks that traditional views either lead to this kind of ideal idealism that is Aristotle and Plato, or that it can't just, it just is not taken seriously, which is Epicureanism, just like enjoy yourself hedonism. And so that's a very um, simplified uh, phrase of Epicureanism. So sorry if you're an Epicureanist and would disagree with that. Um, one must start from how men do live. One must lower one's sights. The immediate corollary is the reinterpretation of virtue. Virtue must not be understood as that for the sake of which the commonwealth exists, but virtue exists exclusively for the sake of the commonwealth. Okay, this is kind of what I was saying before, that... The government isn't supposed to realize virtue. Virtue is supposed to be used to realize the commonwealth. So again, Machiavelli's turning traditional philosophy on its head. Political life proper is not subject to morality. Morality is not possible outside of political philosophy. It presupposes political philosophy. Pol or political society, oh my god. 
Political society cannot be established and preserved by staying within the limits of morality, for the simple reason that the effect or the condition cannot precede the cause or the condition. Okay, what is, what is that? Political society cannot be established and preserved by staying within the limits of morality. Simple reason. So, political society can't act on morality because morality is presupposed in political society already. That's what he's saying. Okay. Furthermore, the establishment of political society, and even of the most desirable political society, does not depend on chance. For chance can be conquered or or corrupt matter can be transformed into incorrupt matter. Okay, so does not depend on chance. So again, Machiavelli is, is saying that the, uh, when, when something bad happens, it, it wasn't a matter of chance, it was just a matter of incompetence. And if you have a government that is corrupt, you, you can change it by making it uncorrupt. It's, it's not an impossible task. There's a guarantee for the solution of the political problem because A, the goal is lower and in harmony with what men mostly desire. And chance can be conquered. Okay, so the solution that Machiavelli is saying is it's not trying to point towards ideal goals uh, that are impossible. It's, it's actually making some reasonable scoped goals that we can accomplish. Uh, I don't know if you've ever been in a meeting and people are like, we want to ship this thing in a month. And then you're like, oh, I can't because uh, here's the eight weeks of work that is required. It, 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 it kind of puts a scientific mind on things, what Machiavelli is doing. The political problem becomes a technical problem. Exactly. As Hobbes puts it, when commonwealths come to be dissolved by intestine discord, the fault is not in men as they are the matter, but as they are the makers of them. It's not the reason why it doesn't work is not because men are men and it's chance, it's because men did not act in the way that they could have. The matter is not corrupt or vicious. There is no evil in men which cannot be controlled. What is required is not divine grace, morality, nor formation of character, but institutions with teeth in them. So there's not this ideal morality that we're just not adhering to. There's not this kind of formation of character that we can't control. It's just we lack the faculty. We lack the institution to get it done. Or to quote Kant, Kant, Kant is also much later than Machiavelli. Um, but it is kind of furthers the same ideas that Machiavelli is saying here. The establishment of the right social order does not require, as people are in the habit of saying, a, na a nation of angels. That's so great. Hard as it may sound, the problem of establishing the state is, insol is soluble even for a nation of devils, provided they have sense. Oh, that's <laughs> so good. It's so Kant. Uh, so as, as long as they make sense, then you can establish a state. You just need reason. You can use your reason to control the world. That's what Kant is saying. Provided their selfishness is enlightened, the fundamental political problem is simply one of good organization of the state of which man is indeed capable. Okay. So as long as we use our faculty of reason and we act in the right way, we can achieve a good state. We have to use our powers of virtue that we have um, to realize the state. Okay. In order to do justice, to change affected by Machiavelli, one must consider two great changes which occurred after his time, but which were in harmony with his spirit. The first is the revolution of natural science, the emergence of modern natural science. The rejection of final causes, and therewith also the concept of chance, destroyed the theoretical basis of classical political philosophy. The new natural science differs from the various forms of the older one, not only because of its new understanding of nature, but also the especially 
but also and especially because of its understanding of science. Knowledge is no longer understood as fundamentally receptive. The initiative is understand and understanding is with man, not with the cosmic order. So our grasp of understanding the world is not a function of this divine providence. Our function of understanding the world is within us. It's within our reason. It's, it's our responsibility to seek knowledge as individuals. So in seeking knowledge, man calls before nature a tribunal of his reason. He puts nature to the question. Francis Bacon. <clears throat> Knowing is a kind of making. So our, our understanding of the world is kind of putting something into the world. It's a creation, it's a building. Human understanding prescribes nature its laws. Man's power is infinitely greater than was hitherto believed. Not only can man transform corrupts, sorry. <clears throat> not only can man can transform corrupt human matter into incorrupt human matter or conquer chance all truth and meaning originate in man they are not inherent in a cosmic order which exists independently of man's activity correspondingly poetry is no longer understood as inspired imitation or reproduction but as creativity poetry isn't some ideal thing that we need to just continue copying it's it's something that comes out of the individual the purpose of science is reinterpreted. Uh, propter potentium. For the relief of man's estate, for the conquest of nature, for the maximum control, the systematic control of the natural conditions of human life. Conquest of nature implies that nature is the enemy, that chaos to be reduced to order. Everything good is due to man's labor rather than the nature's gift. Nature supplies only the only the almost worthless materials. Accordingly, the political society is in no way natural. The state is simply an artifact due to covenants. Man's perfection is not the natural end of man, but an ideal freely formed man, formed by man. So this kind of ideal thing that we should be striving for, which again isn't like an idealism of what traditional political philosophy is saying, is, is created by man. And uh, let's see. And this is also something interesting. So with our ability to reason, to use natural science, um, it implies that nature is working against us. So we see nature as something that is something to be overcome. And it's within our faculty of reason that we must do that and kind of create man as we want man to be created. The second post-Machiavellian change, which is in harmony with his spirit concerns, which is in harmony with the spirit, concerns political philosophy or moral philosophy alone. Machiavelli had completely severed the connection between politics and natural law or natural right, with justice understood as something independent of human arbitrariness. The Machiavellian re revolution acquired its full force only when that connection was restored. When justice or natural right were reinterpreted in Machiavelli's spirit. This was the work primarily of Hobbes. One can describe the change affected by Hobbes as follows. Whereas pri prior to him, natural law was understood in the light of a hierarchy of man's ends in which self-preservation occupied the lowest place, Hobbes understood natural law in terms of self-preservation alone. In connection with this, natural law came to be understood primarily in terms of the right of right self prison as the right of self-preservation as distinguished from any obligation or duty a development which cultivate culminates in the substitution of the rights of man for natural law nature replaced by man laws replaced by rights already in hobbes himself the natural right to self-preservation includes the right to corporal liberty and to a condition in which man is not weary of life. It approaches the right to comfortable self-preservation, which is the pivot of Locke's teaching. I can here only assert that the increased emphasis on economics is a consequence of this. Eventually, we arrive at the view that universal affluence and peace is the necessary and sufficient condition of perfect justice. Okay. Um, 
I don't think I'm going to go over all of that, but I think the biggest point here is, again, the second post-Machiavellian change where the harmony and spirit concerns political and moral philosophy. Um, let's see. So the natural law and natural right assumes that there is some natural way to be man and that we should, that kind of idealism where we should go towards. It's it's not about that. It's about something that is uh, that is something that man creates, and uh, so if there is some end, it's not about self preservation. It's not about your self preservation. It's about reaching that end. And what Hobbes did is that he made kind of self preservation the kind of thing to strive for, not this end that was created with idealism or the, the ideal idealism that was was prior okay cool so that was that was only the first wave i i don't think i realized how much speaking this would be but since i'm already more than halfway through i'll continue but i'm going to take a short break put on some music and I'll be back in five minutes. I can put on my cool uh, Be Right Back screen.
All right, back. Some intense music. CDM music to get you pumped for more Leo stress. <clears throat> okay, so just to kind of recap, I mean, we, we, we went through a lot, but to recap, um, there's this kind of crisis, which uh, stress saying is, is, is obvious and has to do with kind of this Western tradition of political philosophy. Uh, the crisis of modernity but first we have to kind of understand what modernity means in this in this sense and we went back to the notion of modernity as something that was traditional back with aristotle where um kind of political philosophy or political society it was a means to achieving kind of the virtuous life and the virtuous life is this ideal that man should be in um, conformity with nature and um, <clears throat> and society should basically promote man to be forward towards nature or conform to nature and Machiavelli kind of turned this on his head uh, Machiavelli is kind of the first quote unquote uh, at least according to Strauss modern political um, philosopher uh, where he said um, well, I guess Machiavelli's idea and Hobbes implemented his idea, but Machiavelli said that it's not virtue that we should be striving for. We should be using virtue as means to striving for what is practically like reasonable towards a good society. Um, we can't achieve an ideal society. We should. It's not what we ought to be. It is what it, it's about what is and what we have in front of us and it requires a great person with strength and power in order to basically shape um, the government or the sovereign into a form where, uh, with with virtue, in a form to achieve um, kind of a well-functioning well -functioning government. And so where Aristotle said we should conform to nature, Machiavelli says we should conform to the sovereign. And it's not about what we ought to be, it's about what we are now and how we want to make that better. Okay. Okay. So that was the first wave. Again, we have three waves. Um, I think the other two waves, I mean, we're already kind of halfway through, so it won't be as long as the first one, but let's see how it goes. Sorry, got an itch. Okay. Clear my throat before I start. The second wave of modernity begins with Rousseau. He changed the moral climate of the West as profoundly as Machiavelli. Okay, so where Machiavelli is kind of iterating on top of Aristotle, Rousseau is going to be iterating on top of Machiavelli. Just as I did in the case of Machiavelli, I shall describe the character of Rousseau's thought by commenting on two or three sentences of his. The characteristics of the first wave of modernity were the reduction of the moral and political problem to a technical problem. And the concept of nature is in need of being overlaid by civilization as a mere artifact. Okay. So again, the characteristics of the first wave, which is Machiavelli's wave, is the reduction of kind of this moral ideal state into uh, a technical problem, similar to how we kind of looked at the Enlightenment, where we used our reason to basically understand the world. Uh, traditional philosophy changed to a modern philosophy where we used our kind of reason to shape what the government was instead of trying to reach for some ideal state. The concept of the nature was in the... Okay. Both characteristics became the targets of Rousseau's, Rousseau's critique. So Rousseau is going to make criticism on both the idea of government as something that is strive for idealism, 
also with something that should be strived as a technical problem. He thinks both of these are wrong. <clears throat> as for the first, the ancient politicians spoke unceasingly of manners and virtue, or speak of nothing but trade and money. So this is a critique on Machiavelli's system, and this is actually, it's, uh, it, sounds, it sounds too close. Everything is about uh, our speech of nothing but trade and money. So everything is about kind of efficiency and utility. Rousseau protested in the name of virtue, of the genuine non-utilitarian virtue of the classic classical republics against the degrading and enervating doctrines of his predecessors. He opposed both the stifling spirit of the absolute monarchy and the more or less cynical commercialism of the modern republics. Yet he could not restore the classical concept of virtue as the natural end of man, as a perfection of man's nature. So he didn't like what we got with Machiavelli, but he also decided that we can't just go back to Aristotle. There's something needs to be something new. He was forced to reinterpret virtue because he took over the modern concept of the state of nature as the state in which man finds himself at the beginning. So he still wants this concept of virtue, but he doesn't want the concept of virtue in the way that Aristotle sees it. He doesn't want to see it as what man ought to be. Um, he wants to basically redefine what virtue means. He did not merely take over this concept from Hobbes and Hobbes' successors. He thought it through to its conclusion. The philosophers who have examined the foundations of society have all of them felt the necessity to go back to the state of nature, but not one of them has arrived there. Rousseau did arrive there because he saw that man in the state of nature is a man stripped of everything which he has acquired by his own efforts. Man is in the state of nature is subhuman or prehuman. His humanity or rationality have been acquired in a long process. In post rousseauian language, man's humanity is due not to the nature, but to the history. So that's the key statement here. What Rousseau is saying is, it's not the nature of man that gives him his essence, it's the history. It's kind of this time that we're thrown into, the culture, the events that are happening around us, um, that makes us kind of who we are and gives us the context in order for us to determine what virtue means and how to achieve it. Okay, so it's for, uh, but to history, to the historical process. A singular or unique process, which is not teleological. Again, it's, it's not something that, uh, it's at it, as it ends, it's, it's kind of a end of process. Yeah. Okay. The end of the process or its peak was not foreseen or foreseeable, but it came to sight only with the approach of the possibility of fully actualizing man's rationality or humanity. The concept of history, historical process, as a single process in which man becomes human without intending it, is a consequence of Rousseau's radicalization of the Hobbesian concept of the state of nature. So there's there's a lot of background here. I don't, I don't I don't think I have enough knowledge to go over all of it, but both Rousseau and Hobbes um, wrote about what man is like in the state of nature. And the state of nature is basically man not in civilization. And Hobbesian, or Hobbes made the argument that uh, in the state of nature, we're all kind of fighting for ourselves. And therefore, uh, since we're fighting for ourselves, we're going to be violent towards one another. And we need a government in order to keep rules between us, to keep contracts between us so we don't fight each other. And Rousseau's concept of the state of nature is very different. I forget exactly how it's uh, explained, but it's, it's not Hobbesian. Um, but it came to sight only with the approach of the possibility of fully actualizing man. The concept of history, of the historical process, is a single process in which a man becomes human without intending it. So history isn't something that is kind of leading towards some idealism that we're calling virtue. 
we're not making progress towards it. History is kind of this thing that man is becoming whatever it's going to become, and what results is going to be a function. It is going to determine um, what it means to be virtuous. Okay. Yet how can we? Yet how can we know that a certain state in man's development is the peak? So how do we know that we've like reached the top? How, I mean, we're, we're nowhere done. Or more generally, how can we distinguish good from bad if man is by nature subhuman, if the state of nature is subhuman? So if we're not in civilization and it's subhuman, how do we know that it's good or bad, that civilization is actually giving us what we want? Let us repeat, okay? Rousseau's natural man lacks not merely as Hobbes' natural man does, sociality, but rationality as well. He is not the rational animal, but the animal which is a free agent, or more precisely, which possesses an almost unlimited perfect, perfectibility or malleability. But how ought he to be molded or to mold himself? Man's nature seems to be wholly insufficient to give him guidance. The guidance which it gives him is limited to this. Under certain conditions, in a certain stage of his development, man is unable to preserve himself except by establishing civil society. Okay, so what Rousseau is saying here is that man is inherently malleable. We can change ourselves. We develop behaviors. We kind of adapt to our environment. And the function of society isn't to protect us like the Hobbesian notion. It's to basically give us the tools to understand what it means to be good. Yet he would endanger his self-preservation if he did not make sure that civil society has a definite structure, a structure conducive to his self-preservation. So he wouldn't join uh, civil society if it didn't preserve his self-preservation, if it didn't help him. Man must get within society the full equivalent of the freedom which he possessed in the state of nature. All members of society must be equally subject and wholly subject to the laws to the making of which everyone must be able to contribute. There must not be any possibility of appealing from the laws, the law, the positive laws to a higher law, a natural law, for such an appeal would endanger the rule of laws. So we can't have a static goal like some natural law because if we're going to be malleable, we need it to be enough such that it's going to be within something that we can accept as humans. The source of the positive law, and of nothing but the positive law, is the general will. So this is a definitely a Rousseauian idea, where it's not some kind of ideal will or ideal virtue that we are all trying to get towards. The general will kind of comes out of being in a civil society, and that's the thing that we should strive for. A will inherent and imminent in properly constituted society takes the place of the transcendent natural law. That's just what I just said. Modernity started from the dissatisfaction with the gulf between the is and the ought, the actual and the ideal. The solution suggested in the first wave was to bring the ought closer to the is by lowering the ought, by conceiving of the ought as not making too high demands on men, or as being in agreement with men's most powerful and most common passion. In spite of this lowering, the fundamental difference between the is and the ought remained. Even Hobbes could not simply deny the legitimacy of the appeal from the is, the established order, to the ought, the natural moral order. Rousseau's concept of the general will, which as much cannot err, which by merely being is what it ought to be, showed how the gulf between the is and the ought can be overcome. Strictly speaking, Rousseau showed this only under the condition that his doctrine of the general will, his political doctrine proper, is linked with his doctrine of the historical process. And this linking was the work of Rousseau's great successors, uh, Kant and Hegel, rather than Rousseau himself. According to his view, the rational or just society, the society characterized by the existence of the general will, known to be the general will, the ideal is necessarily actualized by the historical process without men's intending to actualize it. So it's not about 
us setting a goal in the future and being like, this is what we want society to be. And then we're going to have a plan to get there. It's kind of what is seen as good reveals itself over time by our interactions in communities. And again, Rousseau did not specifically say how this is done. That was led uh, or that was done by his successors, Kant, um, who has the idea of the categorical imperative, um, which says that we should treat every rule as if it was a universal rule. Um, uh, a common example of that would be uh, if it's, it's uh, say, you have a rule where it's say, oh, I can go to the library and steal any book that I want. Uh, that wouldn't fit Kant's definition of being a valid rule in the categorical imperative because if everybody went to the library to steal a book, then there would be no more books left and no one could, not everyone could steal books anymore. So, um, so Kant basically tried to consolidate uh, reason, a universal law of reason, in order to create a just society. And Hegel uh, took a more historical approach. And there, there's so much to talk about here that I'm just going to skip over it. <clears throat> okay. But the, the, the important thing here is um, that the society... Uh, that what is considered the general will, which is something that we're striving for, the ideal, it's not something that is transcendent, it's something that is actualized by the historical process. Okay. So why can the general will not err? So this is the question. So if this kind of process naturally reveals itself through the historical process, this, uh, this general will, this, well, how do we know it's good? Um, how do we know it's not bad? You know, it's, it's bad habits do exist. So why is it like not a bad habit? Why is the general will necessary for the good? And the answer is, it is good because it is rational, and it is rational because it is general. It emerges through the generalization of the particular will, of of the will which, as such, is not good. What Rousseau has in mind is the necessity in a republican society for everyone to transform his wishes, his demands on his fellows into a form of laws. He cannot leave it at saying, I do not wish to pay taxes. He must propose a law to abolish taxes. In transforming his wish into law, he realizes the folly of his primary or particular will. It is then the mere generality of the will which vouches for its goodness. So he's making the argument that um, say one day I have a certain will where it's like, I don't want to pay taxes, so I'll write up the will. And then through my actualizing of this law that's going to abolish taxes, I understand why taxes are actually necessary. Um, and so I, then I, I stop doing it. So there's, there's kind of a trust in human rationality of the processes that are created that it, there's inherent goodness there. Okay. It is then the mere generality of a will which vouches for its goodness. That's what I just said. It is not necessary to have recourse to any substantive consideration, to any consideration of what man's nature, his natural perfection, requires. This epoch making thought reaches full clarity in Kant's moral doctrine. The sufficient test for the goodness of maxims is their susceptibility of becoming principles of universal legislation. This is the categor categorical imperative I was talking about just a second ago. The mere form of rationality, i.e. universality, vouches for the goodness of the content. So if it's universal, it can be universally upheld, then it's good. Therefore, the moral laws, as laws of freedom, are no longer understood as natural laws. Moral and political ideals are established without reference to man's nature. So this, again, this concept of the traditional philosophy where you have this ideal state that we're making, or this ideal vision that we're making laws based off of, it, we're not referring to that anymore when we're making these universal laws. We're referring to our own rationality and being in the world as human agents. Moral and political ideals are established without reference to man's nature. 
man is radically liberated from the tutelage of nature. Arguments against the ideal which are taken from man's nature, as known by the uncontestable experience of the ages, are no longer of importance. What is called man's nature is merely the result of man's development hitherto. It is merely man's past, which cannot give any guidance for man's possible future. The only guidance regarding the future, regarding what men ought to do or aspire to, is supplied by reason. Reason replaces nature. This is the meaning of the assertion that the ought has no basis whatsoever in the is. So, basically, reason is reason is king. There's there's no ought of what we ought to do. Uh, it's it's applied by what can be arguable argued as a reasonable endeavor, something that can be universally established. Okay, so this much of Rousseau's thought, which inspired Kant and German idealistic philosophy, the philosophy of freedom. But there's another fundamental thought of Rousseau, no less important than the one indicated, which was indeed abandoned by Kant and his successors, but which bore fruit in another part of the globe. German idealism accepted and radicalized the notion of the general will and the implications of that concept. It abandoned Rousseau's own qualifications of this line of reasoning. Man was born free and everywhere he was in chains. How, how has this change taken place? I do not know. How can we make the change legitimate? I believe I can answer that question. I.e., the, the free society, the society characterized by the existence within it of a general will, is distinguished from a despotically ruled society as legitimate bondage from a legitimate bondage. Oh, I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to understand this. Brain is starting to go. Man was born free and everywhere he chance. So that's the, the noble savage idea of Rousseau. German idea. So Rousseau's thought about reason kind of being the, uh, the force behind history that's going to give us um, the ideal that we're going to strive towards. Um, Kant and Hegel use that. But there's another idea, and this is the idea of the noble savage. Man cannot find his freedom in any society. He can find his freedom only by returning from society, however good and legitimate to nature. In other words, self-preservation, the constant of the fundamental natural right from which the social contract is derived, is not the fundamental fact. Self-preservation would not be good if mere life, mere existence, were not good. The goodness of mere existence is experienced in sentiment of existence. It is the sentiment which gives rise to the concern with preservation of existence, to all human activity. But that concern prevents the fundamental enjoyment and makes man miserable. Only by returning to the fundamental experience can man become happy. Only few men are able to achieve this while most, almost all men are capable of acting in conformity with the derivative right of self-preservation of the living of citizens. Of the citizen is required that he does his duty, and the citizen must be virtuous, but virtue is not goodness. Goodness, without a sense of duty or obligation, without effort, no virtue without effort, is the preserve of the natural man, of the man who lives on the fringes of society without being a part of it. There is an unbridgeable gulf between the world of virtue, reason, moral freedom, history on the one hand and nature, natural and goodness on the other. There's unbridgeable. So there's it's the dichotomy between being in a society, being driven by virtue, and being in nature, and the noble savage, and uh, having your own kind of sense of goodness. I guess that's, that's what I get from this. <clears throat> Okay. At this point, a general remark on the notion of modernity seems to be appropriate. Modernity was understood from the beginning in contradistinction to antiquity, antiquity 
Modernity could therefore include the medieval world. Um, because it started with Machiavelli. The difference between the modern and the medieval on the one hand and antiquity on the other was interpreted around 1800 as the difference between the romantic and the classic. In the narrower sense, the romanticism meant the movement of thought and feeling, which was initiated by Rousseau. Surely, romanticism is more clearly modern than classicism in any of its forms. Perhaps the greatest document of the fertile conflict between modernity and antiquity understood as the conflict between the Romantic and the Classic is Goethe's Faust. I think this is just a side note that he's making. I, I don't want to get into this general remark. Yeah, I think he's just basically had an idea and wanted to write this down, so it's just kind of beside what we're what we're reading, so I, I don't want to get into Faust. Maybe later. Okay, just as the second wave of modernity is related to Rousseau, the third wave is related to Nietzsche. Rousseau confronts us with the antinomy of nature on the one hand and civil society, reason, morality, history on the other, in such a way that the fundamental phenomenon is the beatific sentiment of existence, of the union and communion with nature, which belongs together on the side of nature as distinguished from reason and society. The third wave may be described as being constituted by the new understanding of the sentiment of, a, of existence. That sentiment is the experience of terror and anguish rather than the harmony and peace, and is the sentiment of historic existence as necessarily tragic. So again, Rousseau talking about being in the state of nature as something that should be seen as inherently good. Um, Nietzsche, who's the third wave that... Uh, Strauss is talking about is basically questioning that idea of existence and instead of uh, the mere thought of existence as having this concept of uh, terror and anguish and that existence is necessarily tragic the human problem is indeed insoluble as a social problem as Rousseau had said but there is no escape from the human to nature there is no possibility of genuine happiness or the highest of which man is capable has nothing to do with happiness uh, that's Sounds sad. Come on, Nietzsche. Oh, he's a party pooper. Okay, I quote Nietzsche. All philosophers have the common defect that they start from present day man and believe that they can reach their goal by an analysis of present day man. Lack of historical sense is the inherited defect of all philosophers. There goes Nietzsche again attacking everybody. Uh, so Rousseau, again, based his whole idea off of um, how kind of political society should be run based off of this kind of idea of history making progress. No, progress in the sense that there are things or uh, there are oughts that come out of history that are that kind of reveal the good. But what Nietzsche is attacking here is kind of this historical process itself. Why is history good? Nietzsche's critique of all other of all earlier philosophers is a restatement of Rousseau's critique of all earlier philosophers. But what makes much sense in Rousseau is very strange in Nietzsche. For between Rousseau and Nietzsche, there has taken place the discovery of history. So again, Rousseau was the first one to point out that history is something that we can find our ideals. The century between Rousseau and Nietzsche is the age of historical sense. Nietzsche implies, the essence of history has hitherto been misunderstood. The most powerful philosopher of history was Hegel. For Hegel, the historical process was a rational and reasonable process, a progress culminating in the rational state, the post-revolutionary state. So for Hegel, um, who lived... Uh, around the same time as Nietzsche, or I guess a little bit before, maybe one generation before. Um, his big idea was that his historical pro process was resulting in a sort of progress towards some absolute good. Um, Christianity is the true or absolute religion, but Christianity consists in the reconciliation with the world uh, and its complete secularization, a process begun with the Reformation. The Reformation. 
continued by the Enlightenment and completed in a post-revolutionary state, which is the first state consciously based upon the recognition of the rights of man. In the case of Hegel, we are indeed compelled to say that the essence of modernity is secularized Christianity. So through our reason, using this kind of, using our reason to advance history, this historical process is converging on some point in the distance that is kind of the transcendent end of history. Kind of, if you can imagine like a bar graph, it's like we're constantly making progress through rationality. That's Hegel's idea. And so it's secularized Christianity because Christianity has its ideals, um, but it's not based off of a, a rationalistic process. It's based off of faith. So Hegel's idea is that if we continue this rationalization from the Enlightenment, eventually we'll get to a state where we have ideals, we'll understand the world, and history will be over. I think. I think that's what he's saying. According to Hegel, there is then a peak and end of history. This makes it possible for him to reconcile the idea of philosophical truth, philosophic truth, with the fact that every philosopher is a son of his time. The true and final philosophy belongs to the absolute moment in history, to the peak of history. Post Hegelian thought rejected the notion that there can be an end or peak of history. It understood the historical process as an unfinished or unfinishable thing, and yet maintained the now basis really belief in the rationality or progressive character. So whether there's an end or whether there's not an end, there's an idea that his, this historical process is, is progressive, that we are making progress over time. And Nietzsche was the first to face this situation. Okay, so Nietzsche's coming on the scene now. Be prepared, Hegel. The insight that all principles of thought and action are historical cannot be attenuated by the baseless hope that the historical sequence of these principles is progressive, or that the historical process has any intrinsic meaning and intrinsic directness. All ideals are the outcome of human creative acts, of free human projects, that form that horizon within which specific cultures were possible. They do not order themselves into a system, and there are no possibility of genuine synthesis of them. Yet all known ideals claim to have an objective support in nature, or in God, or in reason. The historical insight destroys that claim, and therewith all known ideals, for precisely the realization of the true origin of all ideals, in human creations or projects, makes possible a radically new kind of project, the transvaluation of all values, a project that is in agreement with a new insight, yet not deducible from it, for otherwise it would not be due to a creative act. Okay, so Nietzsche, so Nietzsche says, this idea that history, this process of history is, is making progress towards an ideal is, is baloney. You know, history is fallible. It's, uh, it's built on accidents. Uh, we can't go to it in order to try to understand how we should be living or which ideals we should be striving for. Instead, what is, uh, what does he say here? But precisely the realization of the true origin of all ideals in human race makes possibly a radically new kind of transvaluation of values. I think he says more about this in the next paragraph. So Nietzsche is saying that there's there's no ideals. Um, so if, if we take a, a quick step back, uh, you have Aristotle says the ideal is to be in conformity with nature. Machiavelli says the ideal is to be in conformity with the powerful, the sovereign. Rousseau says we should be in conformity with the general will. Um, that kind of comes out of the historical process. And then finally Nietzsche comes out of nowhere and he's like, the historical process is, is it's it's no good. 
why are we conforming to things anyway? What's what are we doing here? It's like the guy who's just like ah, it's just like okay, okay, Nietzsche, you could say that if you want. He's he's basically like, why are we conforming to things? There's there's no reason to strive for any ideals. No. You should do what you want to do. Not have to not worry about whether you're conforming to something or not. Okay, we're, we're getting to the end, so if you are watching this video in the future, then I congratulate you. But does all this not imply that the truth has finally been discovered, that truth about all possible principles of thought and action? Nietzsche seems to hesitate between admitting this and presenting his understanding of the truth as his project for or his interpretation. Yet, in fact, he did the former. He believed he had discovered the fundamental unity between man's creativity and all beings. Wherever I found life, I found will to power. The transvaluation of values which Nietzsche tries to achieve is ultimately justified by the fact that its root is the highest will to power, a high, higher will to power than the one which gave rise to earlier values. Not man as he hitherto was. <clears throat> Sorry, water. Okay, um, the transvaluation of values, which Nietzsche tries to achieve, is ultimately justified by the fact that its root is the highest will to power. Um, not man as he hitherto was, even at his highest, but only the overman will be able to live in accordance with the transvaluation of values. The final insight into being leads in the to the final ideal. Nietzsche does not, like Hegel, claim that the final insight succeeds the actualization of the final ideal, but rather that the final insight opens the way for the actualization of the final ideal. So what Nietzsche is, is saying is that there isn't any kind of ideal out there, but or there isn't any kind of final stance, final ideal that we should strive for. Um, what he says is, let's see, The, the Overman is uh, also known as the Superman in, in Nietzsche lingo, but uh, it's it's kind of the, the 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 final kind of form, or the next kind of evolutionary form that Nietzsche thinks uh, that uh, the Overman represents, the the man who becomes amoral and uh, basically becomes who he is. Um, I think. Uh, basically not adhering to any kind of one conformity or one value kind of uh, being in accordance with the transvaluation of values. So it's it's not that the overman seeks a certain value, it's the overman is kind of the gateway towards finding that final ideal. And uh, this, I think what that means is it's just about becoming kind of who you are and that's kind of different for everybody i think that's what nietzsche's trying to say in this respect nietzsche's view resembles marx's but there is a fundamental difference between nietzsche and marx for marx the coming of the class of society is necessary whereas for nietzsche the coming of the overman depends on man's free choice only one thing is certain for nietzsche regarding the future the end has come for man as he has, as he was hitherto. What will come is either the overman or the last man. The last man, the lowest and most decayed man, the herd man, without any ideals and aspirations, but well fed, well clothed, well housed, well medicated by ordinary physicians and by psychiatrists, is Marx's man of the future seen from an anti-Marxist point of view. So the opposite of the overman. Uh, the one who basically listens uh or the overman who kind of takes charge of uh values and kind of dictates his own life and is kind of an adventurer and explorer of the world the opposite is kind of the lazy person who uh who basically is uh what's, what's the best way of saying it 
I mean, the, the last man, the lowest, most decayed man, the herd man, person who doesn't really have any voice or values, just kind of goes with the flow and doesn't really do anything with their life and just is kind of well pampered. And it's like the opposite of what Nietzsche wants. Okay, in spite of the radical opposition between Marx and Nietzsche, the final state of the peak is characterized in the eyes of both Marx and Nietzsche by the fact that it marks the end of the rule of chance and will be, for the first time, the master of his fate. So again, kind of uh, the traditional philosophy, which is based off of like, no where we don't have control over our lives. This is basically the opposite saying where man will be in the first time master of his own fate. Okay. There is one difficulty particular to Nietzsche. For Nietzsche, all genuinely, for all genuinely human life, every high culture has necessarily a hierarchic or aristocratic character. The highest culture of the future must be in accordance with the natural order of rank among men, which Nietzsche in principle understands along platonic lines. Yet how can there be a natural order of rank given the, so to speak, infinite power of the overman? For Nietzsche too, the fact that almost all men are defective or fragmentary cannot be due to an authoritarian nature, but can be no more than inheritance of the past or of history as it has developed hitherto. To avoid this difficulty, to avoid the longing for the equality of all men when man is at the peak of its power, Nietzsche needs nature or the past as authoritative, or at least inescapable. Yet since it no longer for him an undeniable fact, he must will it or postulate it. This is the meaning of his doctrine of eternal return. The return of the past of the whole past must be willed if the overman is not to be is to be possible. All right, we're going to the last page. I think I'm just gonna quickly get through this and then uh, take a break. Surely the nature of man is will to power, and this means on the primary level the will to overpower others. Man does not by nature will equality. Man derives enjoyment from overpowering others as well as himself, whereas Rousseau's natural man is compassionate, Nietzsche's natural man is cruel. No surprise there. What Nietzsche says in regard to political action is much more indefinite and vague than what Marx says. In a sense, all political use of Nietzsche is a perversion of his teaching. Nevertheless, what he said was read by political men and inspired them. He is as little responsible for fascism as Rousseau is responsible for Jacobism. This means, however, that he is as much responsible for fascism as Rousseau is for Jacobinism. Uh, for those of you who are not aware, uh, the uh, the Nazi party used Nietzsche's ideas in order to inspire uh, inspire their people. Uh, Nietzsche had was not alive at all before the, the he didn't see any of World War Two or World War One. I. I mean, he died in nineteenth century, but still his ideas were used. Um, Nietzsche was an anti-Semitic either. It's a common um, misunderstanding. I draw a political conclusion from the foregoing, for, foregoing remarks. The theory of a liberal democracy, as well as communism, originated in the first and second waves of modernity. The political implication of the third wave proved to be fascism. Yet this undeniable fact does not permit us to return to the earlier forms of modern thought, the critique of modern rationalism, or of the modern belief in reason by Nietzsche cannot be dismissed or forgotten. This is the deepest reason for the crisis of liberal democracy. 
theoretical crisis does not necessarily lead to practical crisis for the superiority of liberal democracy to communism, Stalinist or post-Stalinist, is obvious enough. And above all, liberal democracy is in contradistinction to communism and fascism, it derives powerful support from a way of thinking which cannot be called modern at all, the pre-modern thought of our Western tradition. That's it. We did it. We got through the whole thing. Oh my god. My voice. Well, now you get a free recording of the three waves of modernity if you ever want it. Hope those who joined enjoyed it. To do a quick recap. Uh, so what Leo Strauss is doing, again, he lived in the 20th century. Uh, he spent most of his time in the University of Chicago. Uh, he was trying to diagnose kind of the crisis of modernity that he kind of said, and he, he does it in three different waves. Uh, the first wave is Machiavelli, and he basically is a reaction to the previous idea of what it meant to be in a civil society, where a civil society was meant to achieve uh, the virtue, virtuous kind of natural law, or we ought to be in accordance with the natural law. And he did this by changing, we shouldn't look at idealism, we should look at what's happening in front of our eyes. You know, we should use the power that is within us to control the world. And that kind of same idea was applied in the Enlightenment when people started using reason to grasp knowledge from the world instead of relying on faith and uh, kind of just tending to religious uh, views. From there, uh, the society got very utilitarian heavy, lots of based on money, and Rousseau was basically a counter example to that. This is the second wave. Uh, and he said that, oh, what do you say? It's, it's that we can't really find virtue in uh, power, because it leads to this scenario. Instead, we should find virtue in what kind of reveals itself over time as a part of being in this historical kind of process. So when a society comes together, uh, we determine rules. Those rules are changed. Some rules stay. Those rules that stay kind of have some inherent good qualities to them, and we should keep those. And that's the general will. Um, and then Nietzsche comes along, 19th century, and he says, uh, you know, taking lessons from history is... There's no kind of inherent reason why we should be doing this. Uh, in fact, why are we conforming to anything at all? There's it's just kind of a game that we've all been playing. Uh, and instead, we should derive kind of what we ought to do based off of our own kind of personal uh, desires and drives. So, yeah. It's kind of like a historical lesson. There's lots of content in here. Uh, my voice is shot. But uh, I hope you enjoyed. And I think I'm going to sign off.